What's up everybody, welcome back to Tidal Gardens. In this video, we're going to be talking about lobophilia, the lobed brain coral. So in the reef aquarium hobby, there's a lot of corals that are kind of this umbrella of brain corals. There's your favia and favites. Even um, some people consider like acanthophilia a brain coral. But I think of all of these types of corals, Lobophilia is one of the few that actually looks like a human brain, once it gets larger, of course. So you can see some examples here. Mainly, these corals come from either Australia or from Indonesia. However, because at least at the time of this video, there is an Indonesian ban on export. So pretty much every Lobophilia that you're going to be seeing, it's going to be an Australian piece. Unfortunately, there is a pretty big difference between an Australian and an Indonesian lobophilia. Back when I first was getting into this hobby, pretty much the entire gamut of all these lobed brain corals were coming from Indonesia because Australia wasn't even an open geography at the time. And I remember having these corals do very well for me, and I started to propagate them even. And by propagate, I we're not talking about the, the standards of modern propagation where everybody seems to have a diamond bladed bandsaw. There's all these references that you can go look at online to see how to do this properly. There really weren't any best practices at the, at the time. And the way that I would propagate lobophilia was basically to hit them with a hammer and chisel. They would splinter apart and have kind of dangling bits of flesh. They just take scissors snip them off right there and sure enough these things would all heal and regrow into nice brain coral shapes again but australian lobophilia tend to be quite a bit more sensitive in fact i personally would never even try to propagate them unless they've already separated out and you're essentially cutting through uh, the dead portion of the skeleton i would never intentionally cut through the flesh of it Perhaps there's other folks that have been more successful with that approach, but for me, I'm a little bit gun shy for that because I've had this particular coral, I've had them struggle for just really random reasons, like it was touching the glass for some reason. And just the fact that it's pressed up against the glass, oh no, we're gonna die back halfway. They're quite a bit more sensitive. That kind of leads me to wonder if these are actually lobophilia. There are there's definite geographical differences in corals. That's just kind of how they are. There's a big difference between Australian versus Indonesian elegances, where the Australian elegances are quite a lot more hardy than the Indonesian variety. But sometimes I wonder, because of there's such a variation in their shape, that I wonder if some of these are actually symphilia that are getting exported over here as lobophilia. And if you've seen my other video on symphilia specifically, They've got amazing coloration, but they are extraordinarily difficult to keep. So anyways, I'd like to go over some care tips that I found really help out even the, the most sensitive of these lobophilia. So let's hop right into it. So the first thing that I wanna cover is feeding. I think that lobophilia, especially these Australian varieties, pretty much have to be fed and have to be fed aggressively. When they come right over, they look fine, but the way that they behave almost instantaneously when, whenever food is introduced makes me think that they're basically just starving for nutrient. Pretty much the only times I've been successful with this kind of brain coral is when I've taken the additional time to spot feed them every other day, minimum every other day. I try to feed a combination of different foods whether it be a frozen food, such as frozen mysis, krill, a little bit of rotifer even, because that sometimes entices their tentacles to, to come out. But they've also taken quite nicely to a high quality coral food pellet, such as these pellets here from Fauna Marine. If you decide to try to feed these corals, there's a couple of little tips that might help. So first off, it's not a very aggressive uh, coral when it comes to grabbing the food. So they do respond well to food in the water. So sometimes what I like to do is give a light dusting of a frozen food just so the fish and everything can eat. 
and that usually entices those feeding tentacles to come out. But still, they're not exactly the most aggressive predators. So I would definitely recommend turning off your pumps. And if you have particularly boisterous fish, especially tangs and things of that sort, I would consider getting some sort of feeding cage to put over the coral momentarily. Now once the coral has fully grabbed the food and ingested it, that's when I would turn the flow back on and any uneaten food and, and whatnot can get blown away. So let's kind of segue into the flow for these corals. You really don't want to give them too much flow. The way that I would approach flow is give it just enough to blow away uh, waste that it expels and anything that might settle on the coral. And obviously for feeding, you'll turn all that flow off, but you really don't want to blast them with too much current. They won't respond to that too well at all. That also kind of segues into placement. They'll probably do best at, in between like the medium to lower portion of the tank. I've never really seen these guys display any really healthy, light loving behavior. In fact, if anything, I would tend to keep it more towards like the, the lower end of the par spectrum. Anything around like 50 to 75 would do fine. At most, maybe 100 to 200, but again, I really don't think that there's gonna be a lot of benefits at that intensity. And any kind of stress response that you might get from this coral could go sideways in a hurry. So I really wouldn't even venture to explore really high intense lighting for these guys. They'll do fine in low light, just keep them in low light. As far as water chemistry is concerned, a lot of times I hear, especially involving large polyp stony corals that like to be fed, that they like higher nutrient water. I don't know if that's going to work out well in this particular case. Again, lobophilia tend to be a little bit sensitive, so I would worry about high nitrate levels and high phosphate levels that might contribute to algae growth. So even though that they themselves might require additional nutrient in the, in the form of feeding, I would still make sure that the water is very clean. Heavier nutrient removal, but you're supplementing all that nutrient removal with feeding, if that makes sense. The situation that you want to avoid is for them just to start receding back from some sort of overabundance of nitrate, really. And that, that can plague some of these large polyp stonies quite suddenly. So I tend to aim for a lower nutrient level overall. So what kind of aquarist is this coral really suited for? I would say that it's for obviously the lover of large polyp stony corals that's looking for that signature piece in their tank that's not afraid of a challenge because a lot of times large polyp stony coral dominated mixed reefs even, um, a lot of the stuff tends to be fairly easy to take care of. There's gonna be a definite challenge factor associated with these Australian lobophilia. But for that challenge, you get a really interesting coral shape you get an amazing array of colors. You're seeing some varieties here, but pretty much every color combination under the sun is available with these types of things. If, you're, if you look around enough, you can see some insane colored colonies online. They're not the fastest growing corals out there, so if you're looking to do propagation, aside from the risks that I mentioned earlier involving propagation of these guys, it's a slow process. So even for a coral farm like Tidal Gardens, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to dedicate the, the type of space needed to have a sustainable aquaculture of these corals, at least not at this point. But if you're looking for that singular dynamic showpiece in your tank, lobophilia, that might be up your alley. Anyway, that does it for my quick care tips on lobophilia. Hopefully you found some of this information valuable. And if you've had some experience with lobophilia as well and have some care tips of your own, please by all means share it in the comments below. I'm sure everybody can learn from your experience. So thanks again for watching and happy reefing.